just want to uh, give a public service announcement, okay, about water. Because it seems to be, I don't know what it is about us as we get older, we get this little thought in our head that, you know what, I gotta pee all the time, so I'm gonna stop drinking water, right? And how many people right now are in the hospital because they don't drink water? Because they gotta pee. So, my thought is, go ahead and pee and drink lots of water because it's good for you. If you do nothing else for your health but drink lots of water, you're going to be in better shape. I mean, it cleans the body. It does great things. And it, it, it's not going to hurt you. I mean, if you, somebody could say that you could drink enough water that it would hurt you. But you'd have to be crazy to drink that much water. Okay? So go ahead and drink your water. When you see the rain today, think about it. Have some water. It's good for you. All right. Amen. Um, the sermon title today is Preconceived Notions. We're full of them. We're full of preconceived notions. We have all these ideas about how things are and how they're supposed to be and the things that were ingrained and the experiences that we, we had as growing up. And I was just sitting there listening to Monty's song about putting, letting God's law be into my heart. Amen. You know, the Jews of old, they took all these scriptures so literal that they wrote them on little pieces of paper and they would tape them and hang them from their hands and all these things. And that's not what God wanted. He didn't want that. He wanted what Imani was talking about here. He wants it to come into your heart. Let it be real. You see, um, Everything in the Old Testament that talked about literal Israel, as we get into the New Testament, it's talking about spiritual Israel. Okay? And that's what I hope to show today as we go down through and, uh, and look at some of these things. Let us turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. While we're doing this, I'm going to have a little sip of water. Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Ooh, what does that say? Jesus came, right, of the seed of David, and he did what? He put on this flesh, right? Yeah, just like you and I have. Jesus conquered sin, death, and the devil in this equipment. Amen. The same kind of equipment. And I just got to lay my head down because I'm just so weak compared to him. It's unbelievable. And he had no advantage that you and I don't have. Okay? I mean, he did, but he never used it. Because he had disqualified himself. But think about that. And he's called us to walk the same walk that he walked. Not only did he walk our walk, he's willing to come back and walk with us. Amen. to accomplish true victory. Because that's what he's wanting. That's what he's waiting for. Until we have that, we're not going home. It's really that simple. Let's turn to Romans 2. We're probably pretty close to there. In verse 28. 2 and 28. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. You hear this? In the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So, how did the Jews get into so much trouble with Jesus? What, why, did they, why did they not care for him? Why did he not, he stood out? What was the issue? He didn't follow their traditions. He didn't follow their traditions, right? He spoke the spirit, didn't he? They were all in this mechanical movement. They were all about what people see and what they think. 
Jesus was real. Real. And that's what the world's waiting for. A real demonstration of what, you know, B talked about it. If, if everybody was like Jesus, the whole world would be what, did he say? Converted. India, he said. Right? That's what we're waiting for. That's what Jesus is waiting for. He's done it all for us. He's handed us a victory. All we need to do is say yes and thank you. But we make it so difficult. Don't we make it so difficult? Right. Yeah, yeah, pride. Pride is the problem. It's a big issue in all of us. All of us. Even people you think shouldn't have any pride at all. They're prideful. You know? I'm telling you, I don't know. It's just it's the heart. It's the wickedness of our heart. And that's a prideful statement, isn't it? That I just made. Did you hear it? Well, she did, because she started laughing. <laughs> you can't get nothing over at Deborah. She's a sharp tool. Anyways, th th this, is, this is the victory that God wants to give us. And we just, we just stand here and do the same things we've, all, we've always done. And we, we think the same thoughts we've always thought. And where are we going to go? We're not going to get anywhere. We, we got to get rid of the stinking thinking and have some brand new thoughts, some brand new feelings, and some brand new emotions that Jesus wants to give us. He's longing to give us. Think about your own children. I mean, do you ever just look at somebody that you love and just cry because you love them so much? You know? You just love them so much. You hate to see them go through stuff. What do you think Jesus feels about you? Do you think he feels that way? Do you think he sees you that way? Do you, do you think he understands your struggle? I think he does. He, he doesn't want us to carry all of this junk. He paid for the junk on the cross. Yeah. He wants to give you his victory and take all this junk. It's a, what better deal could you possibly imagine? There is no better deal. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by him. Let's turn to Romans chapter 9. And I want to begin in verse 6. Romans chapter 9 and verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Do you hear that? Yes. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. That's spiritual Israel, right? Now, this is what the reformers believe. This is uh, all of this garbage that came in. This is the devil's junk that he wants you to be focused on this little postage size stamp place that they call Israel. And keep your eye on it. Because that's where it's all going to be and that's what's all happening. No. It's God's church. It's Israel. Okay? That's what it's about. Keep your eye on the church because that's where the battle is. The devil is concerned with the church. He wants to confuse the church. God wants to make the church march as an army with banners. Right. Walking together all as one man. That's real victory. You ever see the beauty in that? You ever see the beauty of a marching army? I mean, just look at the, just how beautiful it is. It's awesome. God wants to do this with his people. But you won't see a commander out there telling them what to do. Because they all have God inside their hearts and their minds. Moving as one man. What do you think that does to the gates of hell? What do you think that does to Satan? Because I tell you what, when that day comes, and that day will come because God has promised us that, it's game over. Okay? The devil is a sentenced man. 
the sentence hasn't been put out yet because uh, we haven't done our job. Which is following Him, believing Him, becoming one, loving our brothers and sisters. Really, the true test of Christian character is not loving the lovable. It's loving those who are unlovable. Okay? The difficult, the downtrodden, the guy that just gets under your skin. You know? How did Jesus treat all people? Even Judas, when he kissed him, what did he say? Friend. 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 Could you do that? That somebody that you knew was, I mean, put, he was, he, that's what, he signed your death warrant. I mean, he comes over and kisses you, master, and you call him friend. This is what Jesus does to people. This is how he changes us. This is how he makes us one. Because what happened? Did, did Jesus have pride? Hello? <laughs> no pride. The king of all creation, the commander in chief of the galaxies, beyond what you can imagine, knows everything. And he's humble beyond understanding to put up with me, put up with you. Yeah. Can't we just look and listen to Jesus? Stop all the bickering. Fight the good fight of faith. How is your faith today? The world's gone crazy, man. I mean, the world has lost its stinking mind. Okay? But the darker it gets, the brighter God's people are going to shine. They're going to shine. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians uh, chapter one. Thing. You know, I just can't get the sound of thunder out of my head for, for some reason today. I just 
think of, I'm just thinking about sounds. You think you ever think about just think about God's voice, His command? I mean, he, everything, everything jumps at God's command, except for man. Who is man? What is man? Right? I mean, we're something else. Let us turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. There was bits and parts of this that I wanted, and I decided, you know what, we're just going to go on down through chapter 4. Cause, uh, it's going to be better this way. You ready? What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh has found, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath worth whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. You hear that? Yeah. How is righteousness obtained? Believing on God. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. What are you after, brothers and sisters? You after righteousness? I hope you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because when it's all said and done, that's all that's really going to matter. Yes, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without what? Works. Without works. I'm going to pick it up there in just a moment. I want to read a little something real quick. Justification by faith in Christ will be made manifest in transformation of character. This is the sign to the world of the truth of the doctrines we profess. The daily evidence that we are a living church is seen in the fact that we are practicing the Word. Did you hear that? Practicing the Word. What does it mean, practicing the Word? It means you're, you're moving, right? It doesn't mean I'm just mouthing. Because, you know, when all is said and done, there'll be a whole lot more said and done. The world is waiting for a demonstration. Yeah. Not a bunch of talkers. A living testimony goes forth to the world in, in consistent Christian action. It declares to a world apostatized that there is a people who believe that our safety is in clinging to the Bible. This testimony is an unmistakable distinction from that of the great apostate church, which adopts human wisdom and authority in place of wisdom and authority of God. I'll pick it up now in verse 7 of Romans chapter 4. Saying, blessed are those, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Did you hear it? And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Amen? Amen. 
and the father of the circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Did you hear that? For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. What does that mean? Let's, let's go back over that again. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. What does that mean, brothers and sisters? Are we of faith? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. I love that verse. Calls things, calls those things which are not. Be, wait, hang on. God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. We serve an awesome God, don't we? Amen. You know, I'm just reading through this because I don't think it, I need to explain to you what the Bible says. I want the Bible to explain itself. I'm trying to read it slowly. Let it, let it come in. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Amen. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And it's all on God, isn't it? This is all on God. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. How did he get that righteousness? He believed God. Right? And he didn't just mouth it. Right? When he says he believed God, what did it mean? It, mean, it meant action. Mm -hmm. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom what? To whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our what? Justification. Our justification. Justification is so important. Without justification, nothing works. Okay? But, but this justification, we must cherish. Because as we cherish this justification in our lives, or how I talked about looking at somebody that you love so much it just makes you cry, if you look at Jesus this way, and the justification that he has given you, as you walk through life cherishing, you know what happens to you? You become sanctified. All these things that you used to be, you aren't anymore. You come out on the other side a brand new person with brand new feelings, brand new emotions, brand new thoughts, with the absolute 
the mind of Christ. What else do we want but the mind of Christ? Aren't you all looking for peace? Isn't that what we want? Jesus Christ is offering that to us. Amen. Let us turn to John chapter John uh, chapter one. I don't even need to go there. I'll just tell you. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Why did his own receive him not? Why? Because they were focused on. Pardon me. Wasn't what they expected. Ha. He wasn't what they expected. So what did they have? They had preconceived notions. Well, Jesus is going to come this way, he's going to do this, or he's going to whatever. And you know what happens? You don't see anything. Because you're all stuck in this box. you got all this stinking thinking going on. You know? you got your little Play-Doh together, and you pour the water on it. I don't know, what do you bake it? Make it all hard? So rigid. I don't know if Plato is a very good illustration, but I know where that came from. Anyways, Plato, if you don't cook it, it's malleable, right? You can work with it. I want to read a little something here. While the Jews desired the advent of the Messiah, they had no true conception of his mission. Amen. They did not seek the redemption from sin, but the deliverance from the Romans. That's what they were after. Amen. They looked for the Messiah to come as a conqueror to break the oppressor's power and exalt Israel to universal dominion. Thus the way was prepared for them to reject the Savior. Hatred of the Romans and national and spiritual pride led the Jews still to adhere rigorously to their forms of worship. Think about that. Do we become that? Do we just become pew warmers? Going mindlessly every Sabbath. The people in their darkness and oppression and the rulers thirsting for power long for the coming one who would vanquish their enemies and restore the kingdom to Israel. They had studied the prophecies but without spiritual insight. I hope you guys are capturing the whole spiritual theme of this message today. Thus they overlook those scriptures that point to the humiliation of Christ's advent and misapply those that speak of his second coming. Pride obscured their vision. <coughs> they interpreted prophecy in accordance with their selfish desires. Let us turn to Acts. Can we, can we uh, be warned of having the same problems? Could we walk the same road? Mm -hmm. Acts 14, and I want to go to verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much what? Tribulation. Tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Hmm. We want this Christian walk to be a cakewalk, don't we? <coughs> we want it to be soft and wonderful and warm. What, what road did Jesus walk? He walked a hard road, didn't he? Mm -hmm. The Bible calls him the man of sorrows, right? Acquainted with grief. His capacity.
capacity to love and to feel pain is beyond our imagination. Our proud hearts love glory, but not humiliation and suffering. And that's just natural to all of us. That's who we are, because we're all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. In the kingdom of grace, Jesus gives spiritual...